Welcome uh, everybody to our last session. Uh, the first speaker of the session is uh, Noga Zaslavsky from MIT. And the talk will be about efficient coding, efficient compression and human semantic systems. Thanks, Noga, pleasure to see you. Thank you, Dimitris, and thank you. Thanks. I would like to thank all of the organizers for this uh, wonderful workshop and for having me here. So let me just share my screen. Um, do you see this? Yep. Okay, good. Um, so yes, today I will talk about efficient compression and human semantic systems. And the broad question that I would like to touch is, what computational principles may explain human semantic systems? And by semantic systems, I mean a mapping or the different ways languages assign meanings to words. And more specifically, the motivation in this work is to, to understand semantic systems in terms of general optimization principles. First of all, because we want to better understand human languages, but also from a machine learning perspective, if we have such principles, then they could help us make progress towards AI systems with human-like semantics. So how do semantic systems across languages look like? So in this talk, I will focus specifically on two semantic domains, color naming and container naming, uh, which will take us test cases, although we also uh, considered other semantic domains, which I will not discuss today. So um, in the case of color naming, we have large scale data set from over 100 languages of non-industrialized societies. These data were collected in the 70s by Berlin K as part of a project that is called the World Color Survey. And we also have more recent color naming data from English that was collected by Lindsay and Brown. So what you see here is the standard uh, color naming grid where speakers of each language were asked to provide a name for each one of these 330 color chips that you see here. So here's just an example from the English color name data. And you can see that most of the speakers in response to this color chip um, use the term blue to describe this color, but others some use also other terms such as turquoise. And when we average the responses across uh, speakers, we get a color naming distribution. So this is, here's a sample of this distribution. So here are four languages, for example. Uh, for each langu language, you see the contour plot of its naming distribution plotted on top of this uh, color naming grid. And what you see here are probabilities of 40% and above. So for example, uh, this green blob here in this language corresponds to a green category somewhere here in the grid. And the reason I know it's green is, even though I don't know much about this language, is because the colors here are not arbitrary. They reflect the scent rate of each category. In addition, we see these white regions that correspond to pro low probabilities below 40%. And these regions reflect low agreement across uh, speakers or inconsistent naming patterns. So just by looking at these four examples, you can see that there is a wide variation across languages, right? The language have different, not only different number of categories, but also the structure of the categories is um, very different. But at the same time, we also see some patterns that are similar across languages. For example, all of these languages have a red category. The, um, the color categories in these languages tend to have soft rather than sharp category boundaries. And we see these white regions across the inconsistent uh, naming regions across all of these languages. So you can see that even in this relatively simple semantic domain, we already see a lot of interesting structure and phenomena that we would like to explain with a good model. But this is just for colors. In the case of containers, um, uh, things might look different, right? So here we have a um, different data set that was uh, collected by White et al. with respect uh, to a large set of uh, container images. So here you see just a few examples. Uh, and as before, speakers uh, were asked to provide a name for each one of these uh, containers. And in this case, we have naming data from Dutch and French uh, monolingual speakers. So here is an example. Uh, so let's take this container, for example. And here are the uh, naming responses averaged across the Dutch participants. And you can see that also in this case, we have a nice distribution across categories, across words, so, which reflects the fact that also container categories tend to have soft rather than sharp category boundaries. And here are also the, the similar results for the French uh, participants. And in this case, you see that uh, even though we still get a nice distribution, here all of the categories have probabilities of lower than 40%, which reflects the fact that also in this case, we can see in patterns of inconsistent naming, even, uh, we, and even in two 
um, closely related languages like Dutch and French, we can see also these interesting differences. So how can we explain this rich set of phenomena uh, that we see in these data? So one very important computational approach that was applied to, to these two domains and also to other semantic domains is based on the notion of efficient communication. That is that languages optimize some trade-off between accuracy and cognitive effort. And this idea uh, has been applied both to container naming and to color naming and also to several other domains and also to many other aspects of language. However, three important questions were left open. Uh, first of all, when you look at the literature of, uh, on efficient communication, you see that there are many different ways to formulate this notion of efficiency. And so it has not been clear whether we can explain word meanings across languages and across domains using an independently motivated principle rather than ad hoc definitions. Second open question is that it has not been clear to what extent soft semantic categories and patterns of inconsistent naming that we see in the data are efficient for communication. Intuitively, these phenomena induce ambiguity to the communication and therefore may pose a challenge for efficiency. And third, it has not been clear how drive for efficiency is related to language evolution. So what I will argue today is that efficient compression under limited capacity resources can address these three open questions. And more specifically, the main idea is that languages efficiently compress meanings into words by optimizing the information bottleneck principle. So the information bottleneck was introduced by T. Schwedel in 1999. It is a very general information theoretic principle with broad scope, and it is closely related to Shannon's rate distortion theory. And actually, I will, in this work, I will use the uh, rate distortion interpretation of the information bottleneck. And so before I define all of this precisely, I just want to give you some uh, intuition. So we can uh, think about information bottleneck as a trade-off between the complexity and accuracy of the lexicon. So now we can take any semantic system, whether it's an actual one or hypothetical one, and plot it as a point on this uh, information plane. Now this plane is divided into two regions. All the points above the black curve are unachievable and the points below the black curve are achievable, and the black curve itself is a theoretical, theoretical limit of efficiency, which is defined by the set of optimal information bottleneck systems for different trade-offs between complexity and accuracy. So if you only care about minimizing complexity, we get a system here at the origin where all the colors, for example, are mapped to a single category, and this is, of course, not informative. And as we increase complexity, we get systems also with a higher accuracy until we reach the upper end where we get a maximally complex but also maximally accurate system where all the color where each color is mapped to its own category and what i will show you today is that we can take the actual languages uh, that we see in our data and map them onto points along this theoretical limit okay so in the rest of my talk i will first define precisely our theoretical framework. I will then show you empirical evidence uh, from the two semantic domains uh, I mentioned at the beginning, colors and containers. And at the last part of my talk, I will show you how we can take this approach and use that in order to derive semantic systems from neural networks that are trained for vision. So let's start with a very basic uh, communication model. Um, that is essentially based on Shannon's communication model where we have a speaker that uh, tries to communicate some message M by encoding it into a word W, and then the listener receives W and tries to infer the speaker's intended uh, message by constructing some estimator M hat. And here we are interested specifically in uh, the optimality of the encoder, and so we assume that the listener is an optimal vision listener with respect to the speaker. Now, this is still a very general communication model, in our specific case, the speaker and listener are trying to communicate over some uh, shared environment. And therefore, we assume that these messages or meanings, M and M hat, are mental representations of this environment, which we define as probability distributions or beliefs over a set of relevant features, which we denote here by U. So for example, in the case of colors, we ground these mental representations in a standard color perceptual space, which is this three-dimensional space that you see here. And so the set of relevant uh, uh, features, U here, is defined by the three uh, perceptual dimensions in this case, in, in this space. And so we assume that the speaker mentally represents each color as a Gaussian distribution over this three-dimensional space that encodes it it encodes this representation of color into a word, and then the listener tries to reconstruct the speaker's mental 
representation. Similarly, we can also define mental representations for other elements in the environment, such as containers. Now, we'll, in, some, in, in this case, is, uh, it's slightly more complicated, and so I'll we'll discuss this in more details later on. Okay, so um, in order to instantiate this model, uh, we need to, uh, first of all, specify this underlying representation of the domain, uh, which you see, um, which is what, what we just discussed. And we also need to uh, specify a knee distribution or a prior over the possible elements that reflects how often we, they, they are needed in natural communication. And so estimating this, um, um, this component is actually an interesting question on its own, uh, which I will, but it's not the main focus of this talk. And so I'll just say that we systematically evaluated several methods and the results I will show you today are based on the notion of least informative priors. And I'm happy to discuss this afterwards if you're interested. Okay, so now that we've defined this communication model, we can ask what would be an optimal semantic system? And by semantic system here, I simply mean an encoder. Right, which is equivalent or analogous to a naming distribution, which is a probability of words given uh, elements that we're trying to communicate. So as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, according to the information bottleneck principle, optimal systems should optimize a trade-off between complexity and accuracy. Where complexity here is measured by the mutual information between M and W, which is exactly the same complexity measure that we have in rate distortion theory, and it roughly measures the number of bits that we need in order to encode M using W. Now, high accuracy corresponds to low distortion between M and M hat. And since we define these as two distributions, then a natural distortion measure in this case is the KL divergence between them. And so minimizing this distortion amounts to maximizing accuracy. And it's possible to show that the expected distortion equals some constant minus this inf second informational term, which is the mutual information between words and you, the set of relevant uh, perceptual features. And so we take this second information, mutual information, to be our measure of accuracy. And so putting everything together, we get that optimal semantic systems should minimize complexity while maximizing accuracy for some trade-off beta between these two competing objectives. So just to remind you, we're interested in testing the hypothesis that languages efficiently compress meanings into words by optimizing uh, the information bottleneck principle. And now that we define this uh, hypothesis precisely, we can derive uh, two predictions from two quantitative predictions from this hypothesis. So first of all, if this hypothesis is true, then uh, languages uh, should be near the theoretical limit, namely their inefficiency or deviation from optimality. This Distance here should be small, but not only that, if we take the full um, naming distribution of the language and compare that to the actual, the full system, uh, the nearest system, optimal system along the theoretical limit, then these two naming systems, the, optim the actual one and the encoder, should be similar to each other. Okay, so now that we've defined these uh, two predictions, we can go ahead and test them in the two semantic domains. I've mentioned, and so I'll start by showing the results for color naming, and then I'll show the results for containers. So here are the quantitative results for color naming. And as you can see, um, across languages, both inefficiency and dissimilarity for our information bottleneck mo model are small. And importantly, they're much smaller, much better, low values here are better, uh, compared to a previous model, this RKK model, which was proposed in um, previous work. And uh, I'd like to emphasize that I've adjusted this um, previous model such that the underlying um, communication model in both cases is exactly the same. And so the only difference between these two models is the optimization principle that we use in order to derive the optimal system. So the improvement that we see here is only due to the fact that we grounded our notion of optimality in a fundamental information theoretic principle. Okay, so as much as I like this quantitative analysis, I think that it's actually much more convincing to look at the data. So here are the, all of the languages in our color naming data set, plotted again on this uh, information plane. And as you can see, all of these languages now are very close to the theoretical limit, which means that they're near optimally efficient. Not only that, they lie along the steepest region of the curve, right? Where every extra bit in complexity gives relatively high gain in accuracy. 
Now, in order to get a better sense of the similarity between the actual systems and the optimal ones, let's look again at the uh, set of the four examples that I showed you at the beginning. And here are the, op the corresponding optimal systems for each language. So for each language, we assigned, assigned the nearest system along the curve. And by comparing the upper rows, which are data, and the lower, lower row, which is uh, the model, you can see that there is a remarkable similarity between the actual systems and the, and the optimal systems. And more specifically, the optimal systems capture a lot of the structure that we see in the data, including uh, the fact that we have soft semantic categories in, in the case of colors. And we also see these white regions, which correspond to inconsistent naming. So this provides a theoretical explanation for why soft semantic categories and inconsistent naming across speakers can be efficient for communication. Now, at this point, I would like to emphasize that all of the components of the model are fixed across languages. And the only thing that varies is this beta parameter that controls the cross language variation, essentially. OK, so now I've uh, addressed these uh, three open questions, th these, the first two open questions. But how is all of this related to language evolution? So first, a little bit of background. One of the most influential ideas uh, in this context was proposed by Berlin and Kay, who suggested that language, that color naming systems uh, evolve by following um, a sequence of discrete stages, where at each stage, another color term is added to the language. However, others have argued that color terms are more, emerge more gradually, often in regions of color space, which were previously inconsistently named. And what we'll show you now is that we, if we look at how the optimal systems evolve as we gradually change beta, we get a process uh, that synthesizes both discrete and continuous aspects of these previous um, seemingly opposing uh, accounts of color category evolution. So I will show this uh, in this movie. Uh, on the left, you see the same information plane as before. There will be a red dot here that will travel along the curve, indicating the location of the optimal system along the curve. And on the right, you will see the optimal system. So just in case the uh, movie doesn't work well, you can also find it here on this link. Okay, so we start. So you can see that the system changes continuously, but there are also critical points in which new categories emerge. And at some point, the system become way too complex, uh, but that's OK. It's far from the region where actual languages lie. OK, so now we can take this, uh, the whole trajectory of the optimal systems that I just, just showed you in the movie, and we can summarize this trajectory in this bifurcation diagram where each line here corresponds to color category. And you can see very clearly that the categories change gradually, but there are also critical points along this trajectory where new category emerge. So now we can take each language in our data set and map it onto a point along this theoretically derived evolutionary uh, trajectory for color categories. Okay, so now I've addressed these three open questions, but only in the case of color naming. However, the information bottleneck um, principle does not is not specific to color, and so it may also apply to other semantic domains. And in fact, we have applied it to other domains. So let's talk about now. Let's talk now about uh, container naming. So uh, recall that in order to uh, instantiate this communication model for another uh, domain, we first need to specify the underlying representation. So what are these uh, mental distributions that are associated with containers? So as opposed to color naming, where we were able to ground these mental representations in a standard um, perceptual space, in the case of container naming and more generally, we don't have such space. So to address this question, this problem, we followed uh, Xu et al, who proposed to ground this distribution in uh, human or non-linguistic human similarity judgments. So for each two containers in our data set, White et al also collected uh, or estimated his similarity score based on non-linguistic human similarity judgments. So now we can take these similarity scores uh, between each two containers and following Xu et al, we assume that each container is mentally represented using this similarity-based distribution. So this is the speaker's representation, and then the listener tries to reconstruct the, 
the speaker's mental representation. And so now that we have this model, we can estimate the theoretical limit for container naming exactly as we did before. So here it is. And if our hypothesis is correct, then we would expect that also in this case, languages will lie near the theoretical limit. And so here we have two languages, Dutch and French. And indeed, as predicted, both of these languages lie near the theoretical limit. And we did also a very a careful um, quantitative, quantitative analysis also in this case, but I'm skipping that uh, for the sake of time. So while this result is nice, um, grounding the model in human similarity judgments is actually um, somewhat limited uh, because this approach doesn't scale, right? Uh, collecting such data can be very challenging in large domains, and it's intractable if you want to go beyond a domain-specific analysis. So one possible solution for this is to leverage cognitively motivated deep learning models that are trained for vision in order to generate these underlying uh, representations of the domain. And so this brings me to the last part of my talk where I will show you how we can build on this approach in order to derive optimal semantic systems from neural networks that are trained for vision. So um, as an initial step for testing this idea, we considered uh, Cornet S, which is a brain-inspired image classifier consisting of mainly uh, four layers which are mapped to the cortical areas in the visual ventral stream. And the advantage of this model is that it achieves both high accuracy and ImageNet, and also its representations are highly correlated with um, brain activity in the corresponding layers. So now the question is, can Quarant S provide a useful underlying representation for semantics? So T.Y. Sapi, who is a graduate student at MIT, picked up this question, and he's the one who did the analysis here. So the, here's the main idea. We take the uh, container images uh, from our Simula set, we feed them into this model and generate representations at each layer. And based on this representation, we construct a similar similarity matrix for each layer based on the, by computing the cosine similarity between the representations of every two containers in our data, in, our, in the Simula set. And now we take these similarity matrices and use them as input to the IB model instead of the um, human similarity judgments that we use in the previous model. And now we get a prediction for each layer for what would be for how optimal systems should look like given the underlying representation that was derived from that layer. And now we can take these optimal systems and evaluate them against the actual uh, human systems that we have, in this case, Dutch and French. So what we should expect, what we expect to see, is some um, gradient in performance where the IT layer, which corresponds to high-level visual representations, which are more relevant for object recognition, um, should perform better. In other, namely, generate more human-like semantic systems than the uh, shallower layers that corresponds to low low-level visual processing. And so here's what we find. And indeed, we see this near monotonic uh, improvement or um, a metric for evaluation here is this inefficiency scores or low up values are better. And you can see that the IT layer, the representations that arrive from the IT layer gives us the best performing uh, model for explaining the Dutch and French uh, systems. And so um, this suggests that at least in this domain, higher level perceptual features are more relevant for semantic categories and low-level perceptual features. And it also suggests, suggests that we can use this approach to test the relevance of different non-linguistic uh, representations to high-level uh, semantic systems. However, when we compare this to the original model, which was based on human similarity judgments, we see that there is still a gap, and the original model actually performs still performed better than the IT, than the model that is based uh, on the IT representations. And we believe that this gap is because of the fact that Cornet uh, is unable to extract all the relevant aspects and objects that are important for uh, semantic categories. For example, it cannot extract 3D shape or intuitive physics or functional properties of objects which seem to be reflected in human similarity judgments. And so in order to close this gap, we are currently considering other um, models for vision within the same framework uh, with the goal of reaching to this uh, gold standard. 
Okay, so just to conclude, uh, I've showed you that semantic systems across languages achieve uh, near optimal compression. We've focused on two domains, colors and containers, but we also have evidence from other semantic domains. Um, I've showed you that a single flavor of parameter explains, explains much of the cross language variation that we see in the data. And that the optimal systems evolve in an annealing like process that synthesizes both discrete and continuous aspects of uh, uh, color naming evolution. And finally, uh, we've seen that this approach may also give rise to human like semantic systems and artificial neural networks, but we're still trying to close this gap. And just as a final note, I would like to mention that um, we've also um, very recently applied this approach uh, to human pragmatic systems, so moving beyond semantic systems. And if you're interested in that, then uh, you can find our uh, manuscript and archive. So with that, I would like to thank all of my collaborators, and I would like to thank you uh, for your attention. And please let me know if you have any questions. I'll stop sharing. Thanks so much, Noga. That was very exciting. Let's see if we have any questions I can ask one in the meantime. So any intuition why we have this uh, uh, peak in V2? So inefficiency goes up, apparently. So if you want to be sure, what we expect, of course, so obviously from a uh, basic knowledge of visual systems, you know, receptive fields get, get larger, you know, there's integration of some, some sort of integration of lower level, higher level complex, I don't know, uh, cells. We would expect to have some monotonic curve there, right? Right. Any idea why, why this is? Yeah, uh, we were also surprised by that. Um, we're not entirely sure if that's significant, uh, but it could also just suggest that there is there are some low level or intermediate level um, perceptual features that are, um, are relevant uh, for these um, categories. But yeah, that's one of the open questions that we're uh, still looking into. Have you thought also of? Uh, um... So what we have, for example, Eric has shown uh, and uh, other people in the lab, and we saw it also, is there is a gradual progression from uh, sensory representations to more categorical in frontal areas. So if, let's say, object naming uh, presupposes some categorical representations, maybe a better place to look at in the brain and train a network uh, would be not the visual hierarchy, but front of parietal networks. Have you thought about that, maybe? We have a paper I talked yesterday. You can see the video of my talk. <laughs> yeah, I have seen. Um, yeah, you, you talked about colors and, and motion, right? Motion, yep. Yeah. But the important thing is that categories emerge later and not actually for the color task in this particular case, because it was green and red categories only. It wasn't you know, a whole uh, mm -hmm. range of colors like in your case. Uh, but at least in the task that we know that categories were formed, they uh, arise progressively as we go to frontal areas. And uh, yeah, these these were the signals that the you know the animal was using. Effectively. Yeah, th that's a great idea. I mean, the the models we were currently thinking about uh, thinking of are more um, not necessarily uh, brain uh, inspired, but more cognitively inspired. So things like intuitive physics. But you're absolutely right. I mean, um, that's definitely a, another very interesting direction to to look sure. at. Did I get right that the way you model evolution, language evolution, is in a sense, uh, is it fundamentally different from the way you model uh, cross-language uh, variability? So is it about this beta parameter? That right. Very, uh, but wouldn't it be that, how do you model this bifurcation point? So let's say a single language, right, might have different sorts of, I don't know, phase transitions. Uh, than what we have in languages that, uh, you know, in natural languages. What I'm saying is the variability is of different sort. Um, and, and occurs at different time scales. So I presume you've got languages that are, you know, uh, for example, modern languages, right? not ancient English versus, I don't know, modern Dutch or something or... Uh, um, so, so I'm not sure if I... Entirely understood. What I'm saying is, did you model or do you, did you explain uh, cross language variability in a similar way? Yeah. Uh, okay. That you modeled also uh, language evolution because it seems to me that you're talking about two different, let's say, time scales or variability sources. But maybe we can talk about. Yeah. It. Okay. So, I mean, maybe that. The, okay. So, let me un unpack this into two parts. Uh, in terms mm -hmm. of time scales, um, 
you can think about this more of uh, language change rather than language evolution. Like, I mean, it, there is a small nuance there. Uh, I, I would say that is more a model of how languages change uh, or like loosely speaking evolve over time, not necessarily how they come about initially. So in terms of time scale, it's time scale of language change, which I haven't shown by the way, but we do have um, uh, evidence from a single language uh, that has changed substantially over only 40 years or something. And it remained over the course of time near along the theoretical limit. So this is actually prediction that was uh, generated by the model and tested later on uh, later data and was confirmed, which is pretty nice. So the time scale could be, you know, um, 40 years uh, of this changes to occur. Now, let me go back to your first, the first part of the question. So traditionally, the variation that we see in the data has been closely tied to the idea of language evolution or language change under the assumption that we currently, we have like a snapshot of the, of, you know, the current state of languages, of languages of the world. And these languages uh, reflect different evolutionary uh, stages, right? So this assumption, the, 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 this actual idea traces back to Berlin and K where they kind of assume that all of the languages are kind of can be mapped onto some, you know, evolutionary sequence, which explains the variation that we see across languages. Uh, so to a large extent, yes, uh, our, our explanation of, um, of, the variation across languages is closely tied to our explanation of language evolution or language change. Having said that, there are certainly other factors uh, that can explain um, language variation, right? Um, local factors, we also see that the model is not perfect, right? So it captures a lot of the structures that we see in the data, but there are also sm small differences that are not captured. And so we, um, we are not directly modeling that, although there are, this is like a very exciting um, direction for future re research, understanding local effects such as language contact and other facts or social factors that can influence, um, you know, have can have more fine grained influence of uh, on the structure of categories. I see. Yeah, we have a couple of uh, questions. Let me try to convey them to you. Uh, Daniel is asking, do you have an idea what determines the beta for a specific language? Might it be related to the size of the speaker community? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so um, I haven't tested that carefully, um, but uh, my bet is that it's a, basically it determines uh, the capacity that the community allocates to communicating about this domain. So community and uh, um, uh, so, for example, languages that don't care, there are some languages, especially those with a few number of categories that don't really use colors so much. And so they don't, you know, you can um, describe objects many times, not just by their color, but also by other features. So there is some degree of freedom there. And some societies will prefer to use colors, especially industrialized societies where objects tend to, uh, where colors tend to be more, uh, important for distinguishing between objects, but other societies, especially non-industrialized um, places, tend to not prefer colors. So it's it, it's a probably a combination of how accuracy uh, the speaker community needs to be, which probably is related to the size of the community, but also to their preference of using a certain allocating some bandwidth to a certain domain or over other domains. And the other one. Uh, yeah, it's the priors, of course, that you've said. If people uh, were interested, you can tell us. So how were the priors chosen for the color uh, domain? Yeah, um, so this is actually a, a really hard uh, problem, uh, estimating this uh, prior distribution. And so it, um, I've tested several approaches. So the first very naive, straightforward uh, approach is simply to take uniform prior. Uh, but it turns out that this doesn't, uh, um, doesn't perform so well, and it makes sense because it is unlikely that all colors are equally needed for communication. So the second approach uh, that we tested, uh, which was previously proposed in the literature, is to try to estimate uh, this prior based on the frequency of colors and the natural statistics of the environment. So for that, I estimated the um, distribution of our colors from a set of not large set of natural images. And it turns out that this approach also doesn't explain so much so well 
the data that we have. And when you think about it, it also makes sense because the distribution of colors in their environment is not necessarily does not necessarily reflect their social importance, uh, which seems more relevant to language. So, for example, there could be I don't know if you live in the jungle, then green and blue are probably pretty abundant, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you talk more about greens and blues, right? Um, and so um, to address this problem, I took kind of a different approach, which is more data driven. So the idea there is to try to estimate uh, a prior distribution from the data that we have under minimal assumptions. So there are several ways of doing that. One is uh, based on the notion of least informative priors, the second uh, approach that I tested is based on the notion of maximum, just ma applying the maximum entropy principle under some constraints that are uh, that come from the marginal distribution of color terms, which we can estimate from large corpora. And it turns out that these two um, uh, least minimal assumptions, data-driven approaches, actually perform quite similarly and very well. Um, and this is why we use them. I will just say that. Um, of course, we did, you know, in the least informative prior, we, we did cross-validation. And so the, the quantitative analysis is based on held out data. And for the maximum entropy approach, we only used one language to explain the whole uh, set of languages. And so, you know, we made sure that okay. everything is generalizes. I see. Uh, Daniel, do you have something you want to share with us? Please let me know. I can invite you on screen. Um, Otherwise, I think also Larry, who is the next speaker, has also a question and he can join us. So uh, I'll keep you for a moment and also bring Larry on the screen. So he asks about priors. Let's see. So it says accepting, accepted and connecting for Larry. Face visible, wrong camera. Yep. Hi, Larry. Nice right, to meet you. Right camera. Uh, Mike seems to be working. Yeah, everything. All right. No, I, the question that I had uh, concerned the possibility of manipulating the priors. This is something we encounter very often, as we honestly don't know the priors in natural scenes and the like, and we make them up. But another way to address it is to look at the time scale in which priors develop. And if it's just a few days, you can imagine somebody doing a sort of devil wears Prada task, where they're trying to discriminate cerulean from blue. And it's very, very important that they get it right. Would you, after a few hours of training, uh, see a change consistent with the, with the theory? Yeah, so this is a, an interesting idea. So the, the analysis I've presented is kind of a um, population level analysis. So we assume that um, the priors, you know, need to, like, I don't think at the time scale of training and in a few participants in, in, I don't know, one experiment, because we need to, um, to like, this is emergent property within a whole population, right? So we need to manipulate the priors for all the participants in, you know, the population. But one thing that we were thinking about doing is um, manipulating the priors in an iterated uh, learning experiment, where mm. you actually have this kind of setting. And so this is the, uh, this is a cool thing that we were um, mm. trying to do. Okay, thanks so much, Noga. Very nice seeing you. Thank you so much for having me. Yep, have a nice afternoon or day there, Pacific time. <laughs> yeah. So I'll be the gates. Noga, hi, Larry, again. Hi. It's a pleasure having you here. Uh, okay. Professor uh, Larry Maloney from NYU is going to talk about probability distortion maximizes mutual information. Yes. Um, hmm. I'm sorry, I have the PowerPoint. Mm -hmm. So you, you would need to scroll uh, above your uh, your face 
and there yeah. are some buttons that will appear and the second from the right next to the cogwheel has an arrow inside the screen with an arrow and you click on that uh the arrow um is this the upper upper right uh so it's above your face uh, so you're on the right hand side the second button from the right next to the cogwheel uh, but you need to scroll your your uh, pointer above your face because the buttons might be hidden yes i see it and so the second from the right which is yeah technical it wants to check my camera in my mind a moment sorry about this so. presumably i now see me and sorry i didn't hear you uh, it just keeps uh, wanting to change my camera and mic. Yeah, um, the the one the button that shares your screen should be the one that has an arrow inside, an arrow po pointing rightwards. I think. Um, it's I right, yeah, it's rightwards. The option, the arrow. All right, share screen. Thank you. That's it. Excellent. And uh, decided I should share the entire screen. Yep. And start projecting the PowerPoint. Yeah, works perfect, perfectly. Thank you. All right. Everyone okay? Yeah. All right. So today I'm going to be talking about a particular phenomenon that occurs in decision and actually many other areas, and uh, a model that would explain, as a form of bounded rationality, what it is that we're doing right and what we're doing wrong. Uh, this is work done jointly with Hang Zhang, and this is primarily her work. She's at Peking University now. Okay. And in essence, from a biological standpoint, every life is a series of decisions, and every decision involves combining some measure of uncertainty, like probability or frequency, and value, in order to come up with uh, an intelligent or rational way to act. Uh, the claim that we're going to make you know, first is that humans distort probability, frequency, and many other related measures, confidence, and the like. And um, the evidence for this claim is very strong, but I thought I'd have you experience it for yourself. So I'm going to give you a problem and then a second problem. And these problems are typical of decision-making research, decision-making under risk. Um, the amounts of money are large, but um, since this is a virtual conference, you'll be paid in virtual money. Sorry about that. And um, the first problem is, would you rather have a certainty of $30,000 or an 80% chance at $40,000 and a 20% chance of nothing? So take a moment and decide whether you'd prefer to choose A or B. This is typical of decision-making under risk. Okay. And overwhelmingly, subjects choose A, about 80%. And this has been done over and over again. And that would imply from the it's viewpoint of hours. standard economic theory that the utility of 30,000 must be greater than 0.8 times the utility of 40,000, even though we don't know what either of them are, we have the inequality. But now you get a second problem. In the second problem, what I've done is I've scaled the probabilities and uh, by a factor of four. So now you have a 25% chance of 30,000 or 20% chance of 40,000. And how do you feel about picking A? How do you feel about picking B? Which would you prefer? And subjects switch very nicely to B, again, overwhelmingly. And uh, this is an example developed by Maurice Salet in the early 1950s to show that expected utility theory, the only game in town at the time, actually was inconsistent with these two choices. You can't assign utilities because if you look at the last inequality there, the expected utility is less than expected utility, and you multiply that equation by four, you'll find you're looking at the first equation, but with the inequality reversed. So LA's demonstration was that simply we, um, we do not follow expected utility theory and the 
outcome suggests that we distort probabilities very badly. This is something that became part of uh, prospect theory in 1979 and again in 1972, where plotted on the uh, x-axis are probabilities and plotted on the y-axis is how people seem to be using them, the probability weight or decision weight that they use them for. Um, so this is the phenomenon we're looking at, that people take small probabilities and exaggerate them, or large probabilities and underweight them, uh, or the reverse can actually occur. So we're first going to look at a model that captures this kind of distortion and understand how it works. Uh, this is contained in a paper um, from 2012. I think it's the assigned reading for this talk. And the model we're going to use looks a little cryptic at first, but the key thing to focus on is that probability has been recoded as log odds, which is just the logit transformation that you may be familiar with. And then we're going to take that log odds transformation, we're going to put it through a linear transformation. And the linear transformation introduces the distortion. That's a little more obvious when we look at the kinds of curves we can get by varying the two parameters, and that's shown here. If we vary the gamma parameter, we get all sorts of interesting shapes, including ones that look like the data we just looked at. If we vary the other parameter, P0, uh, then basically the curve moves kind of up and down a little bit. And so we can fit any data set or attempt to fit any data set by varying these two parameters. Uh, it's the usual way we would fit a small probabilistic model. If we do that, then we can actually check out the linear and log odds model by re-plotting the axes, not as probability and probability weight, but as log probability, log odds probability, and log odds probability weight. And that's what I've done here on the right. And you can see that the strange looking data due to Kahneman and Tversky, Tversky and Kahneman, turns out to be a beautiful straight line if we plot it in log odds. And uh, we can do that for many, many tasks. I think we did about 27 data sets in our paper in the way taken from other people's articles. And uh, to show, for example, here's 1953, people's estimates of frequency of letters. So this is actually frequency from memory is what they're estimating at, quite possibly. And if we do the transformation to log odds, we get a very nice straight line. And uh, basically people are distorting probability and uh, they're distorting probability according to this model. Uh, we can continue on to look at causes of death, um, which is an absolutely wonderful data set. It's fun to contemplate. There are diseases on this graph that just don't exist anymore, like smallpox. And, um, but in any case, people are pretty good about producing a distorted curvilinear estimate, uh, which actually is clustered around the line. When we replot it as log odds, on the right, it's a very nice straight line. Okay. And that covers six orders of magnitude or probability. Uh, here's Kahneman Tversky again. Again, the R squares are impressive. But in a replication of Kahneman Tversky by Gonzalez and Wu, we have data for individual subjects. So each one of these is a single subject and their use of probability. There are large differences between the subjects and in addition, some of the distortions are huge. So people distort probability quite badly. If you're familiar with signal detection theory, it's actually framed usually in terms of log odds. And so we can directly go to a uh, plot taken from Green and Sweats based on data from 1955. And again, people are grossly distorting probability. So, subjects distort probability in a wide range of tasks that we've just seen, and uh, we can capture a lot of that by this two-parameter family, linear and log odds. And moreover, we demonstrate in the 2012 paper that there are systematic predictable changes in distortion with experimental conditions, in effect, with the task that they're doing. So, you see all this beautiful controlled parametric change 
and it's all a total screw up. And the obvious question is, why does the brain work so hard to get it wrong every time? Okay. So it, another way of putting that is, what controls are what controls probability distortion? We're going to focus on only two tasks. One is decision under risk and the probabilities in that. The other is judgment of relative frequency. And to get you a sense of what a judgment of relative frequency is like, let's do a little experiment. In a moment, you'll see a random assortment of black and white dots. All I want you to tell me is the proportion of the dots that are black, okay? I don't want the absolute number, the proportion of the dots that are black. This is the relative frequency of black. Okay, so make an estimate for yourself. Sorry, that wasn't supposed to happen. And now let's do it again with a different set of stimuli. And um, typically when I do this, um, you'll overestimate in both cases, that's your probability of frequency distortion, and uh, you'll overestimate more in the second case, even though both of the proportions are actually 20%. So people have probability distortion even when they're just counting things. They overestimate both, okay. And subjects distort probability, they do so in a very patterned, very systematic way. The changes are dynamic, they change with task. And it's a bit of a mystery as to why. Okay. So we're going to claim that the decision system is compensating for a cognitive limitation. That in essence, given that limitation, they can't succeed in um, encoding all of the probability information we might ask them to. And uh, we're going to basically document that limitation and then test the claim experimentally. So this is the bounded log odds model, which is uh, in a second paper published uh, just this month, in press just this month. And to give a sense of what we're heading for, one thing about probability is that the dynamic range is immense, potentially. In fact, it's unbounded, potentially. And here we have six orders of magnitude, and people are actually doing a pretty good job of you know, at least uh, putting points on the graph somewhere near the curve. And uh, so we're going to begin with the assumption that the scale that is used for encoding probability is first of all a log odd scale. So we're going to assume that's the basic encoding, assumption one. Second, that there's a, the scale is, internal scale is bounded and uh, stochastic in the fashion of a Thurston scale. So in effect, if you try to use this scale to remember things, what you'll recover from the scale will be um, a Gaussian perturbed version of what you put into it. Moreover, there are just bounds. And we're going to then add something called variance compensation, which is uh, an appeal to efficient encoding. Now, the Thurstone assumption is like a variable focus microscope. You can look at a small range of probabilities and have very high resolution, or you can pan out and look at a much larger range and uh, basically, but your resolution will go down. And if we think about, for example, the frequency of English letters that I began with, well, this frequency uh, here is um, uh, basically trapped somewhere between about 0.12 and zero. It uses a very small part of the probability scale. And so if you were faced with the Thurston limitation, you might say to yourself, well, why don't I remap the scale to use the entire scale to represent just the narrow range where I know the probabilities have to be? And that's the key idea. We're going to use a linear transformation, linear and log odds, in order to make the best use of the Thurston scale, given the constraint in the probabilities in a particular task. If the task changes, the constraint could change and you would want to remap the scale. Now, the second assumption that goes into this concerns the variability of the probability information itself. And when we're talking about frequency estimates, of course, we have only estimates of frequency, estimates of probability, and those come with variances attached. 
And a standard way to deal with those is to remap the internal scale so that regions of low variance, where we know what's going on, are given more scale than regions of high variance, where in fact our information is flaky. So, and uh, so with those two assumptions and none other, we're going to experimentally test these assumptions in two tasks. One will be decision under risk. Uh, one will be relative frequency judgments. The decision under risk is uh, the task of Tversky and Kahneman in 1992. The relative frequency judgments are um, basically what you just went through with the little black and white dots. And we're going to test it in three different ways. We're going to use a new method, uh, factorial model comparison, to basically look at a large group of 12 models and find out if bounded log odds is superior to the other choices. I'll explain that a bit more. And then we're going to compare it to all existing models of decision-making and the risk. And uh, then we're going to look at subject-by-subject -subject results to see how well we capture the subject's own uh, distortions of probability. All right. So the factorial model test is due to Van den Berg, R, and Wei Ji Ma in t uh, just a few years ago. And the way we do it is we set up three conceptual dimensions. One is the use of log odds. And we consider using a log odds scale, we consider an alternative in the decision literature called a product scale, and we consider a linear scale, which is just the probability scale itself. So on this dimension, we're trying to see which of these three assumptions best fits the data. Do we need log odds? Second, we'll look at boundedness of the scale, one of the Thurstone assumptions, versus unbounded. And the last is we either include variance compensation or we don't. Okay. And if you put those all together, I'm sorry, there's one extra line here, but there are 12 models schematized up here at the top of the slide. And we're going to have those models compete. Two versions of the model, uh, one of which is bounds-free, uh, log odds, and no variance compensation is just linear and log odds, the first model that we started with. The other, where we have variance compensation, boundedness, and log odds, is BLO. Now, the measure here is the Akaike information criterion using the corrected form of the test. And the lower you are on the y-axis in these plots, the better the model is fitting the data. But you can see the takeaway is that when you put the assumptions together that make up BLO with log odds, prelic, and linear, uh, basically the model BLO outperforms uh, the, uh, the other 11 models. And uh, the same is true for in the ju judgment of relative frequency task. Uh, BLO is simply dominating the other 11 models. We can also use a trick by which we looked at, at some exceedance probabilities. And these give us, uh, in effect, a Bayesian version of which of the assumptions uh, are best supported. And here, again, the assumptions that make up BLO, the three assumptions, are overwhelmingly supported compared to the others. So that was the first test. The second is that um, basically we can, uh, well, here's a summary. So BLO dominates. Now we also looked at, at the literature and found um, a small number of models intended to predict DMR probability distortion. And so we compared them to a BLO and simply in all cases, BLO was superior. And the last is we ran 75 subjects and all subjects completed both tasks, the judgment of relative frequency and the decision-making task. And uh, we can then just plot their curves. The blue line here is LLO, that's the FOIL. It could be considered as the best model before ours. BLO is shown in red. And now you can go through all 75 subjects, in this case for decision under risk, and get a sense of where the two deviate, the red curve tends to be doing better. Okay, and that in fact is statistically correct. 
we can look at judgments of relative frequency. And what we're looking at here is the residuals between the model prediction and the estimated uh, frequency from data. And again, um, basically BLO is outperforming LLO and doing a fairly good job of following many of the subjects, but not all. Okay. So the BLO parameters are chosen to max. Okay. And, and now the question is this. Uh, we have a limitation that prevents you from ever doing probability correctly. You have free parameters that allow you to alter how you map and represent probability. Uh, there are four of them, it turns out. And now we're going to ask, do you set the BLO parameters in a way that is going to maximize the mutual information between the objective decision variables, the probabilities and the like, and their internal representation. So, do you? So here's mutual information, and we're going to ask how well does the BLO encoding capture the mutual information. I won't define it because you've already seen it several times in this conference. And so what we're looking at here are the two parameters that control the Thurstone scale. That's one of the assumptions underlying the model. The two parameters, if we set them, uh, basically affect the mutual information. And uh, we can compute the mutual information as a heat plot, excuse me, as a contour plot. And uh, you can see it here. And now the red dots are the dots corresponding to the human setting of the parameters, specifically the median setting across all the subjects. And it's uh, remarkably close to the maxima of these two contour plots. If we look at the variance correction, the other assumption, we have two more parameters, kappa and lambda zero, but we find a similar story that the subject's choice of the setting of these parameters leads to a maximization of mutual information. And so this is true for all four of the parameters. The subject has freedom in how they do the representation and uses that freedom to maximize mutual information approximately. So subject to the BLO constraint, the subject chooses bounds and variance compensation that maximize mutual information, a form of bounded rationality. And uh, again, this work is taken several years to complete and is almost entirely the brainchild of Hangzhou at Peking University. And these are the references. Done. Well, I'll put the references up. I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Larry. Uh, Very interesting talk. I think, uh, yeah, maybe you can stop share, screen sharing. I, and I can bring you back back on screen. So to do that? Uh, no worries. Uh, I'll, uh, okay. I, I can bring you back on screen from here, maybe. I've clicked yeah. it. It's, no, it's fine now. We can see you. Yeah. It's fine. Okay, hi. Okay. Ah, you disappeared again. Mm -hmm. do, do you want to click on the button? Yes. Okay, you're back. So let's so see if you have any questions. Mm -hmm. from, uh, from the audience. Here is one. Where does the curve parametrization come from? Where did the, sorry. Where does the curve parametrization come from? Daniel is asking. Daniel That's, parametrization is the model. And uh, the model basically has the Thurston scale and uh, that can be mapped to part of the log odd scale. Those are two parameters that control the location of the mapping. Uh, the second two parameters involve the variance compensation. Is there any way to rotate me 90 degrees? I think. Uh, uh, yeah, I think we're seeing you now. I just noticed I it from the side. I don't know why. Yeah. Yeah, this is what happens when you have two screens. Inevitably, the wrong screen. Uh, uh, yeah, no, the I camera can... is on the wrong screen. Yeah. Let's check your uh, camera, mic, and uh, I can change it here. Built in, save. But you've lost me. There we are. Yes. 
for yeah. your uh, very interesting presentation. And we're going to move on with Tomas, which is around. Thank you so mm -hmm. much, Daniel. Very nice meeting you. I'll disengage you now. All right. Thank you. Ah, sorry, Daniel. Let me bring Daniel. We have a couple of minutes, so I'll bring Daniel to the screen if he wants. All right. And because he, he has some follow-ups, and instead of me reading them, it's maybe yeah. better if he uh, discusses them himself. Let's see. Yes. I think I... So Daniel's question is, I was wondering about the form of the curve. Uh, all right, the uh, ELO curve is slightly different from the LLO curve. And uh, in fact, if you look closely, you can occasionally see little discontinuities in the derivative of the curve. And those correspond to the bounds that are introduced by the Thurston scale. But the LLO curves that have no bounds and no variance compensation still do a remarkable empirical job of capturing the data, but the BLO outperforms the LLO very consistently. Um, but the two curves look roughly similar at a first glance. So does that help a little bit? Yeah. Uh, yes, yes. Which, which paper should I read uh, to, to, to learn more about that? BLO, the LLO paper is the first one. The BLO paper is the second one. So. Okay. The second one is, uh, is uh, on BioArchive right now, right? Bio it's on BioArchive, but there's a much a better version that is unfortunately under embargo right now. But I think it will be available in two or three weeks. Okay. Okay. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Very okay. interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Larry. Nice to see you. Yeah. Other I'll get these engaged, both of you. Yeah. Bye bye. Yeah. I think uh, we all enjoyed it. Hopefully, the audience found the talks. Uh, useful. And yeah, I'd like to thank my organizers, uh, Randy and Daryl. I would like to thank also the support team, uh, George Sertikas and Gersh Dekadiog, my students, and all of you again for participating. So have a good uh, rest of the day, wherever you are. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye.